Okay, hi everyone. Uh, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, we're excited to have you with us tonight. Um, and this is End Ventures webinar on esports, from basement to stadium. Uh, what is next uh, in the benches for esports? Uh, I will start by introducing myself, quick facts about the industry, and then introduce our speakers for tonight. Run over some questions, open a, a Q and A session for the crowd, and and then uh, I'll wrap it up very quick. So we have about uh, 50 or 55 minutes for this session. So we're gonna try to bring all this amazing world of esports into one very dense hour. Um, my name is Kvir Kahlon. I am a general partner here with uh, End Ventures, uh, an Israeli early stage focused VC fund, uh, a passion for deep tech, and as you might have guessed, a sweet spot for esports and gaming. Um, so before I introduce our participants, let's open up with some uh, cool facts. Um, League of Legends, uh, who you uh, may, maybe know one of the biggest games out there in the world, already in 2018 had about 100 million people watching the finals that same year, bigger than the Super Bowl of that year. Uh, Esports is going to be a part of the Olympics in 2024. Um, the first pilot for an a Olympic esports session is going to happen next month. Um, in 2019, the International, which was uh, the finals for Dota 2, another very popular game, uh, had a, 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 a prizes pool of over $34 million. And at the peak of the evening, uh, over 1.1 million people watched the live stream. Uh, in the US, esports is second in popularity only to the NFL and is uh, being expected to surpass the, the NFL very quick. Um, analysts of the industry uh, claim that by 2024, esports will have a global fan base of, and listen to that, 800 million people. And it is expected that the industry will, will grow at a CAGR, uh, uh, an annual growth rate of 20% annual until 2026. Um, the first quarter of, two, of 2021, just right now, uh, games that were played on the uh, Riot Games, uh, who's uh, one of the biggest uh, game publishers in the world, who has the uh, League of Legends and Valorant, had over 800 million hours of pe people watching those games. Um, um, very, very popular sport, as you already guessed. And something uh, a bit fun, to, to know that uh, for myself, a big fashion, a big sneaker head, um, even in the world of sneaker today, uh, you have brands who collaborate with famous uh, esports athletes and gamers. Uh, we have the collaboration between Ninja and Adidas, and we have the collaboration with Team Vital uh, Vitality and Adidas. And, and this industry is just uh, uh, growing rapidly. Um, so as you probably understood from our invite, today we're going to showcase this exciting world of esports and gaming. We have an amazing list of guests uh, from many different sectors of this industry. Uh, we have a, a very popular Israeli gamer and streamer, uh, one of the leading coaches in the industry. Uh, we have tech entrepreneurs who drive the innovation in the space. And we have a representative of one of the leading VCs out there uh, in the world of sports and technology. Uh, so without any further ado, I'm happy to introduce you to our guests. The first one uh, uh, is Jens Hofer, who represents the team of Fanatic. Um, uh, Jens is responsible for drive, driving Fnatic's the performance department. Uh, Fnatic, for everybody to know, is one of the top three esports organizations in the world, uh, having a global fan base of over 55 million people worldwide, and has been uh, already on the top for the last 15 years. Um, his background is within both, both amateur and professional sports, where he had extensive experience as a player, coach, and mental coach. Um, since 2017, he has been working as a full-time esports coach for some of the top teams in the world. Next in line, we have Shachar Sorek uh, from Overwolf. Uh, Shachar is a serial entrepreneur with 12 years of experience in funding, founding and managing both gaming and technology startups. Previously for, uh, to Overwolf, Shachar was the founder and CEO of Seven Elements Studio, a gaming studio specializing in, a multi, in, in large multiplayer strategy games. Uh, currently, he serves as the Chief of market, uh, Marketing Officer for Overwolf, uh, advises startups, and uh, is part of the mentors of the Zen Entrepreneurship Program at uh, IDC Herzliya. Um, we have Reut Arieh with us. Uh, Reut is, is, a, is a pro gamer and a streamer, a very famous one here in Israel. She's known as Queen Nikki. 
Uh, her Twitter uh, has more than uh, 10,000 followers and over 70,000 uh, viewers watch each of her videos. Um, fun fact, apparently uh, as when we were uh, getting ready for this uh, panel, uh, Reut and I found out that, that we both uh, grew up in the same uh, uh, community. So fun fact, um, and Asaf Gazit from Edge Gaming. Asaf uh, served uh, for five years as an officer in elite combat unit in the IDF. He studied uh, uh, computer science and entrepreneurship in the IDC of Celia. And now he's the co-founder and CEO of Edge Gaming, a data-driven company that uh, reimagines the way competitive gamers train and how esports clubs train their athletes and leverage the cognitive data and, uh, to perfect their cognitive skills and uh, uh, tactical skills in non-intrusive ways. Uh, another fun fact, Edge Gaming was a part of the IDCX Accelerator, which us and Ventures are partnering with. Um, actually, the next batch is going to open up in July. So if you know any cool startups, uh, uh, please feel uh, free to send them the application link, which Kesem is now putting in the chat. And last but not least, we have uh, James uh, from 76 Capital. Uh, James is the director of marketing for 76 Capital, uh, one of the leading venture capital firms uh, in the US for sports and esports. Um, James is responsible for all the social media and content strategy, as well as the producer uh, for the 76 Capital Leadership Series. Uh, James is also host of the Skyline Spew podcast and is a blogger for branded sports. Um, after this introduction, now we know our speakers. So I'll shoot, uh, uh, I'll dive straight into the questions. Uh, and the question, uh, and the first question around the popularity of gaming and the evolution of the ecosystem, uh, I'm gonna have a, a Reut answer. So Reut, as, as a leading gamer and streamer, uh, can you shed some insights on how many viewers are watching your streams and how your viewership has evolved over the years? Uh, yes, of course. I started, you can say four years ago, I started uh, streaming on Twitch. Uh, I have to say firsthand, there is a big difference between streaming and different platforms such as Twitch on YouTube, because they're based on different things. One is based on views and one is based on viewers. So I can say that on Twitch, I can range between even 20 people or even 75 people, which is not considered to be a lot. But it depends on the people that are there, not the amount of views that I'm getting in a manage to like make it, as you can say. But the thing is, uh, we started as gamer. Some of us evolved as streamers. Uh, but as you can see right here, I'm sitting with you and doing this webinar and, of course, other conventions and consulting for startups and big companies uh, in the field as well. So when you talked about this, of course, subject from the basement till here, we're actually evolving even beyond streaming. So besides streaming today, we can do a lot of other stuff that are related to it. Uh, of course, it come, when you start at the beginning, you start with a few close friends that comes to support in what you do. And so, you know, slowly but surely, you gather the people that you have common things with and maybe the same background, you can say, and you start building a community. And I can say my community is a family. I have uh, almost a thousand people on my Discord server and we hang out every day, regardless if we're streaming or gaming. It's becoming a full experience besides the gaming and the streaming. So I can say as much as you invest in it and put back to your viewers and show that you care and there are, are the main thing, I think you're evolving this way. And today it's about to blossom even more. So it's growing and growing. I'm pretty excited about that. Thanks, Lud. So another follow-up question to that. Uh, yeah. And you mentioned the community of your viewers. Um, to what level are you engaged with them? Because we, you know, we see traditional sports, right? We see all the people we look up to, but they're very far away from us because we, we only see them on, on the broadcast. Maybe we, when we go to the, to the, to the stadium, for you as, as a popular gamer and streamer, how is your fan base engaged with you? Uh, actually, um, I might be, I think, a little bit different because I spend most of my day uh, with my viewers besides the stream because I can be on Discord. Even though I can have, you know, phone calls and stuff like that, I'm still there. So even if between we have a second just to ask, how was your day? What are you doing? What do you had for lunch? And we have even different categories that people can use IT section or put uh, what they had for lunch or their favorite animals. So we're engaging in a more uh, private way. And for myself, as much as I would like to focus on my gameplay when I'm streaming, I care about more about my audience and the people that are there and actually giving me attention. 
So I can know what skeleton had for lunch, who is getting married, who is moving somewhere. I think my engagement is every day, almost all day, like in between all the time. So yeah. And the demographics of your crowd, do you see uh, mostly men, female? Uh, well, my demographic is a little bit different. At first I started streaming abroad. I didn't aim for the Israeli community, uh, but I started to mix English and Hebrew in my stream and other languages as well. Um, and I started to create a community from here and there. And it ranges between, you can say 17, even though I do not aim for kids, my streaming for 18 plus. Um, I have like viewers from 17 till 65 from the States, from, from everywhere I can think of. I have a lot of people like from Dubai, Saudi Arabia, from everywhere you can think of. And it's a big community and a global community that everybody knows each other. So that's what's beautiful about it. Mm -hmm. So uh, next question uh, to Jens. Um, you lead the, the high performance unit for one of the most popular and, and successful esports organizations out there. Um, how do you, from your experience being in the trenches, I'll call it, how do you compare uh, the fan base and the popularity of athletes uh, for those in traditional sports? And where did you see and are seeing it evolving uh, in the next couple of years? I mean, it's, it's already a very big fan base out there. Uh, Ryu uh, mentioned the, the online fan base, which is quite engaging and, uh, and is already big and, and already growing as well. Uh, but some of the things that we experience is, is the live events uh, when it comes to traveling around with the Counter-Strike teams, uh, our LOL teams and so on, you know, prior to the COVID, of course. Um, but these events would be packed, uh, arenas packed, filled with fans and and quite engaging. And, and I only see it growing more and more. Uh, it's not quite there if you can, you know, compare it to the traditional sports in sheer numbers. Uh, but I definitely think that it will. Uh, and I think now when more non-endemic companies are coming in, bigger sponsors are coming in, it's going to be more, you know, traditional commercials, more content that is going to feed into to the public. So I think it's only going to grow as time goes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Shaha, next question is to you. Uh, as someone who is unfamiliar uh, with what Overwolf does, just maybe start with a brief overview of the company and then uh, let's, let's uh, uh, talk about actually the added value. So, you know, for everybody, we all think that gamers only care about playing the game, right? Uh, why is there a need for uh, such an uh, uh, extensive platform for third party apps? Uh, okay, so first of all, I say that uh, Overwolf is an in-game creation platform, and it has two main arms today. One arm has to do with in-game apps, that's applications that are overlaid over existing games like League of Legends. And the other arm, which I'll talk about later, is a modding arm. Uh, Overwolf bought CurseForge from Twitch last year, which is the biggest modding community. All we do at Overwolf is deal with uh, creation of third parties around games. So in the esports context, um, what happens is a League of Le Legend match goes. So many of the people are not as professional as Fnatic. Many of the players are mid-level players. And what third-party developers, which could be people who play the game, could be startups, build applications that can track stats in real time and help you manage your game and give insights on the game as you're playing. So the more competitive it gets, these apps get used. That's one hand. There's also apps that allow you to grab in real time because Overwolf has something called real time overlay in uh, real time that connects to the events of the game. It also allows you to capture gameplay. So if you're gaming, it will give you a recording of what happened after the game and you can share snippets of that. So just to give you an example of what's gonna happen in the future, you're gonna have star players. Star players don't deal with content. They only deal with playing but there's a full team of people trying to promote them and create content around them. So they can come and create uh, apps on Overwolf to screen grab what's going on already. We have three or four outplayed, fused. There's a few that, uh, that are doing. So the bigger the industry gets on, on the esports side, and it's gonna get very big um, for several reasons. Uh, one of them uh, is that uh, in, in, very different, uh, in a very different way, the esports e is not, soccer doesn't belong to anybody. In esports, the publisher, the game developer owns the full vertical. So there's a lot more control over the various aspects 
of, of making a league happen. And there's also interest in amplifying it. As the more professional it gets, the more the creator or the game developer will enhance. So there's a lot more control over these things and a lot more ability to pump them with resources and grab more content created around the game. Uh, I think that with, with entry of 5G and cross-platform playing, we'll see an amplification of consumption of, uh, of esports in general. And I also think that in general, because of mobile, there's going to be a cross-pollination of users from mid-core mobile users into games. So at large, I think the, the industry is at its infancy. Um, Overwolf deals with a user-generated content in and around games at large. And the more the users are able to create on top of games, the more the community around the game is, they have more zealots, they have more people that coagulate around it, that can participate in it, either it's creating content, either it's gaming, either it's just socializing, either, either it's viewing. So in that sense, it's kind of overall today is the world leader in supplying the picks and shovels of building these third party infrastructures. So we're in this particular inflection point of user-generated content, we see a very, very bright future for esports. So basically, we can say that you are helping uh, a, a, as a startup who uh, created a paradigm shift for, for this world, you are actually also helping the, both the gamers, of course, enjoy the game better, but also the game publishers to keep the retention higher, the LTV higher, right? Um, which makes them play at your side, like be right. And so, so the unique state in which overall is that is one hand, we're creating a new profession because we are allowing in-game app creators and modders to make money. Up until now, modders or modding in games couldn't make money off the game. Even if people played or downloaded your mod a hundred million times, they wouldn't be making money. Overwolf has a business model for these people. So we see young people starting to make a living off of creating things on top of games. For game developers, they're starting to understand, in particular, due to the Roblox IPO, that creating content around games is, is where the future is at. Um, there's some big moves. League of Legends itself is based off a mod, Dota, which is based off World of Warcraft. So there's, an, there's the big evolution of actual game creation, but then the mods themselves get very popular. There's an article the other day, Microsoft's um, you know, modding, modding community around Minecraft generated $350 million. It's, it's a social thing. It's a creator thing. It's part of the passion economy that's coming in the creator economy. So it's, it's a big play by a few major slices of, of interiors of the, of the gaming community at large. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So um, moving back to Jens, uh, try to kind of help us uh, see the, the picture that you are seeing, somebody who trains those athletes, those gamers, um, can you tell us more about the uh, regime, uh, training regime for the athletes? Uh, how has it evolved uh, through the years? And what tools do you have today or missing today uh, uh, when you are training your athletes? Yeah, I mean, we are sort of at a transition phase when it comes to esports. Uh, I think we've we started to go to where we only focused on the in-game content before and only practiced the in-game bits before to where we're starting to see that a holistic approach is going to be more effective to create that consistency of, uh, of getting the results long term. So what we're actually paying attention to now is physical training, nutrition, mental training, making sure that they get the sleep that they need and actually breaking down the training itself within the, uh, within the game into a balanced pieces. Um, so when it comes specifically to the training here at Fnatic, we actually have a head of fitness who works with all of our athletes uh, and creates individualized uh, fitness programs for them, uh, which they are working with. So we work with tools like bands and you know recovery tools and so on. Uh, and right now we're actually tracking two of our teams uh, with health data trackers. Uh, so we're actually getting 24 seven health data from these teams and all these players where we then can go back and see what effect it actually has on, on their play and so on. Gotcha. Very interesting world and very interesting to see how you, you bring stuff from the physical world and, and take it so seriously, nutrition, sleep, uh, that, that's very exciting uh, to us all. So uh, a lot of people probably uh, know edge gaming, but uh, you've identified a gap uh, in both how professional and aspiring gamers are training today. Um, to me, it makes sense uh, that if somebody plays the game more, they're just gonna 
you know, end up being better if they spend more hours. Um, I guess I'm wrong because you have a startup. So tell us about what you do and, and how you see that uh, evolving. Okay, uh, um, so you're not so wrong, it's correct, but you're not, uh, it's, it's not efficient way to improve your skills. Today gamers, both amateur gamers and professional gamers, uh, they're training their skills and they're improving their skills by just playing the game. Maybe they have the luxury, like the gamers in a fanatic, to have nutrition and fitness trainers, but that's not a tool that everyone has. What we have noticed that just playing the game has two main problems. One is that it has a glass ceiling. You cannot improve so far because you can improve your mechanical skills. You can improve the way you shoot, the way you aim, um, maybe the way you are thinking inside the game a little bit, but it has a lot of uh, um, hours you need to play to really see improvement because it's not so much efficient and because it's not focusing on the things that really matters. What we have noticed um, that the things that matters most when it comes to playing are not mechanical skills like how to shoot or how to aim. It's mainly the cognitive skills. It's the way the gamers think inside the game, uh, how fast they make decisions, how creative are their moves, how can anticipate the future moves of the rivals or even communicate between the teammates. How good is this communication and how can they operate under pressure? Those are eventually just cognitive skills that are affecting mostly the performance of the gamers, both the amateurs and the professional gamers. So what we have noticed is uh, uh, this is the gap that the gamers need uh, a focus to really uh, train on what matters. And we have developed the platform that the gamers can now analyze and train their cognitive and mental skills in game. So it's without any intrusive devices, the gamers can just play the game. Our system can analyze their cognitive skills inside the game. And after that, it creates for them the most optimal and adopted training regime uh, that trains their cognitive and mechanical skills inside the game. And that helps not only professional gamers, but also the amateur gamers, the aspiring professional gamers, that wants to become those professional gamers uh, like Fnatic team. Thank you, Asaf. Uh, next question goes to James. Uh, well, 76 Capital uh, here together with myself, but you, you're the speaker. It represents the side of, of the capital going into the industry uh, and the investment side. Um, your fund uh, invests in both sports technologies and the esports uh, technologies. How do you guys uh, see a connection between these two? Um, yeah, let's start with that one. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Um, it's it's really, it's so synergistic. And I think that everything we've seen from the traditional sports space and the need for growth and innovation, um, esports is kind of attacking all those needs. So I think from an engagement perspective, traditional sports has kind of been failing at that the last few years. And now with the integration of sports betting and then also esports and other different initiatives through technology, teams are starting to be able to engage their fans better. So I think if we look at esports as a whole, that's really the, the great thing about it is that everybody can engage. It caters to every different audience and there's so much room for innovation. Um, so for us, we've invested in more of the infrastructure side of things at this point. So we have a company called Nursery Gamers, which when we invested in it, was really focused on, on focusing on the brick and mortar and accessibility side of the industry. So providing top notch gaming PCs at a extremely low cost, um, and allowing people to kind of create communities from that. And during the pandemic, when brick and mortar locations got shut down, they were able to switch to becoming more of a digital provider for tournaments and also streaming. Um, so you mentioned Valorant earlier, they're the sole provider of Valorant tournaments and they realized the opportunity for Valorant to really be a game that is meant for esports, and it's been great for them ever since. So now as the world is reopening, Nurture Gamers is able to open up these different locations across the country and potentially hopefully the world but we had two locations that just opened up in California and two locations in uh, Florida. And we're gonna continue to be able to provide accessibility to esports, but also be able to do so digitally. So for us, it's really taking all the great things about traditional sports and really seeing the future of esports can be able to create more engagement. And again, really, there's a lot of opportunities to pair with professional teams in the same point. So in the US, we've seen a lot of different collaborations between like the Pittsburgh Steelers that have an esports team 
Um, and th there's a lot of owners in this space that have esports teams. And I think we're going to continue to see the interest from the player side as well, where you know, I'm based in Philadelphia. The Sixers have Ben Simmons. The Sixers also have Dignitas in their portfolio. Ben Simmons is a part of FaZe Clan. So these players want to have the opportunity to, you know, be able to become esports athletes just as much as traditional athletes and really be able to use that persona. Um, and again, the great part of it for fans is that it's engaging. You know, I never would be able to talk to a Ben Simmons or another great athlete, but if they're playing Twitch, if they're playing on Twitch and I can interact with them through a chat, it's a pretty great way to get that, uh, that experience. So for us, there's so much opportunity, whether it be on the media side, whether it be on the actual tech side, the developer side, uh, but we're very bullish on the industry and we're just excited to continue to find companies that are disrupting. When, when you look at the industry, um, what gaps have you identified that hold it back in compares to a uh, traditional sport? Yeah, I think a big thing, you know, in my opinion, is analytics. I think there's a lot of analytics right there, but I don't know if it's really democratized so far. Um, I think a lot of that's kind of the way that the publisher developer relationship is and kind of them holding all of the data. So I think as, as soon as the data is kind of more widely available, then analytics is going to become more and more of a factor in esports specifically. Um, now for us, like we look, we're an early stage VC, uh, we look for a large return. I'm not sure how large of a return that type of thing would be, but as far as the need for the industry, figuring out a great analytics platform for teams to use is, is a great step in that direction. I know there's a lot of companies looking to do that. But again, from the engagement side and the fan and the media side, I think there's a ton of opportunity as well. Um, again, the more and more engaging we get, uh, the better chance the industry has of continuing to have success. And, and I, this stat I always like to say is that the esports industry is double the size of both entertainment and music combined. And I mean, that's a pretty telling story right there. So the future's bright. Thanks. Uh, and I'm going to open up some questions uh, to all of you, to all the participants. So uh, whoever wants to jump in, just uh, unmute yourself. Um, so let's talk about, after all, we are venture capital. This is a, a webinar with investors and people from the ecosystem. So I would like to ask from you, uh, people that represent here, the gamers, represent the teams, represent the, the VCs and the, and, and, the, and the startups in the world. How, do you, how is money being made in this world? Uh, what do you know or how can you teach us about the cycle and, and the flow uh, of money, especially uh, what sums are we looking at, you know, in terms of prices and sponsorships? Um, yeah, so whoever wants to go. Um, yeah, if you don't mind, like I'm coming from the perspective of a gamer slash streamer. So um, my way of making a living, you can say it's, of course, the live streams. It comes from the viewers, it can come from subs, from uh, tips uh, on the stream by BTs, which is the virtual uh, currency uh, that Twitch uses. And of course, at one point you can always sell your own merch if it's t-shirts, caps and everything that your viewers uh, can get. And uh, of course, like I said, right now, because it's taking off gaming and streaming. So a lot of companies approach streamers like myself uh, to ask the questions, what are you missing? What are you in need for even to test stuff for them and giving them a live feedback in live stream for their products or their ideas. So it's even like from consulting, um, giving lectures and stuff like that. Uh, but when it comes to professional esport gaming, um, it was like 20, uh, 12, 15 years ago that I played competitively. And from what I hear, uh, everything thus far, I wish it would happen today it's completely different it's amazing and it's in a lot of investment in it uh but there's a lot of way to make it as a streamer and a gamer as of course as sponsors like myself if it's msi logitech and uh some more coming up soon uh so there's a lot of um ways that you can make a living off of gaming and streaming and even branch out to different places so let's say one day i wouldn't be able unfortunately let's say to sit in front of the screen and to talk to people I at least branch to other things in the field that I can keep on going and make uh, from other places. So, yeah. Yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah, I, I change. Cool. yeah. So I think in the U.S. we saw a boom in the investment into teams and leagues, and I think we originally saw that kind of become a bubble in the sense that the valuations got so high so quick, and there was no returns on the on those dollars yet. So I think now we're really seeing this flow of money to everything surrounding the teams and the leagues. Um, and that is more on the streaming side, more on kind of finding the content creators that can then supplement those teams and leagues to continue to create engaging content. Um, I've said content like 30 times because content literally is everything in esports because it's nonstop. And I think you know, there's a lot of money being spent on that side, but also there's a huge feature in esports betting as well. 
Um, I think we're starting to see an introduction of that in the US. It's not mature enough yet because the line makers have no idea how to make lines on esports. But as soon as they get, pe get people to understand the industry, we've seen this growth of sports betting in the US. And I think there's a huge opportunity for esports to follow that same path. So there's a lot of companies that are getting uh, significant funding in the esports betting space. And they're not the same companies that are winning the traditional sports betting space. So it's companies that are trying to be unique, companies trying to use their thought leadership and expertise in esports to create the best betting experience for the esports user, which it tends to be different than that of the traditional sports user. So um, I think there's gonna be a huge increase in that uh, the next few years. And I really think you're gonna see some awesome betting platforms that are made for esports users. And I think that's gonna be great for so many different demographics and, uh, and really create a boom in the US. Maybe Jens, you want to give us uh, the angle of uh, Fanatic, which is one of the biggest out there. I see you have uh, sponsors like uh, BMW and, uh, and Hisense and uh, AMD and all of those brands. So your angle, if you may. Yeah, I mean, for us uh, specifically at Fanatic, it's a bit of a, a mixed bag. We obviously, we make our own apparel. Uh, we make our own gaming gear as well. Uh, and then we we try to you know partner with big partner partners like, like you mentioned like Gucci BMW and so on to to create different projects that that has value for us both uh, and then obviously we have all, all of our professional players that that bring in the prize money uh, from tournaments and from games and so on uh, so yeah it's a bit of a mixture uh, I do think that it has gone from you know companies investing in in esports organizations short term like small amounts to where we're trying and i think this goes for all esports organizations trying to get long term sponsorships now trying to get more meaningful partnerships where you can you know create create more long lasting you know things together uh, so i think there's a transition phase in that where where we're still trying to figure out how do we actually make money together that actually you know it you know returns in a long term benefit so to speak uh, but I do think there's a, a lot of opportunities. The, the special thing about esports is there's really no rules. You can really do, you know, it's such a young, young, you know, young thing still. So you can really do whatever you want as long as it's uh, profitable. Thank you. Anybody else wants to jump on that question before we move to the next one? I think that, uh, like I said before, currently, the, as opposed to other sports, the publisher holds all the eggs. So they sell the ticket to the league, like an Overwatch ticket for, uh, for a team can go up to $20 million per team. And I think that the more complex and, and uh, heterogenic the league becomes, they will need to acquiesce that power to people who specialize in verticals. And it will get buffed out. So this will organically balance out and kind of complement a bit of what Jen spoke about in terms of long-term and planning, because it's the, in the interest of everybody to beef everything up. There's high demand. And currently there's one player in town, which is the publisher that dictates all the vertical. So the more and the bigger the leagues get and the more demand, they will just off either develop their own systems, but usually that doesn't work. So they'll have to, offset and, and kind of give away some of that power. Um, betting wise, by the way, James, you can check uh, G Loot. It's a startup, a well-funded startup from Europe, which was developed on Overwolf that sets out to accomplish betting in real time sports. Uh, there's a few initiatives in this space. I like it. So we have this uh, conversation and then people also say, uh, share, sharing deal flow. So that's, uh, that's awesome. If I can add something. It's an Israeli conversation. I mean, if there's no deal, it's not a successful conversation, right? Right. If I can add something here, Kfir. Um, first of all, I agree with you, Shaha, about the power of the game publishers so far. And there's a lot of money uh, in this market divided between two main players. You have the game publishers and you have the streaming platforms like Twitch, YouTube gaming, uh, etc. And I think that because this market is so much evolving and just starting to figure out the whole ecosystem, there's a lot of opportunities here to develop a new kind of platforms and infrastructures that will uh, um, bring new revenue models inside this ecosystem by connecting uh, the players inside the ecosystem, by creating more tools, by creating more engagement with the fans and the gamers and of course to help the teams 
monetize better. Because if you think now what happened, let's take an example about the Super League uh, that happened a few weeks ago. You can see that even in the traditional sports, you see that the sports, uh, the traditional sports clubs has a problem with monetization and they wanted to take the power to themselves. They wanted to create their own uh, league because eventually let's take uh, uh, example uh, UEFA that's just like the game publishers controlling the power this eventually will bring a lot of opportunities as we see it to that ecosystem and then more players will be able to get inside and have more monetizations uh, uh, solutions inside that platform inside that ecosystem Thanks. Okay, so um, let's now move to the more geeky part of the conversation. Um, you know, esports inherently, right, is uh, very tech driven, plays on computer, plays on servers, plays on those amazing rigs that uh, Reut has in the background. Um, so, from the experience of this uh, uh, beautiful uh, uh, um, panel that we have, where do you see the, the new opportunities for technology to add value to this uh, uh, rapidly growing space? Um, and what are you, maybe, maybe each of you can share, uh, most excited about? Um, maybe I can start on that one. Uh, a, a bit as Asaf has, has touched on before, uh, I think one of the biggest gaps that we have now as far as the, the professional side of esports is how we train and, and how we can use software to actually get better methods of training the game itself and breaking things down into drills that you can repeatedly train and so on and also building in the cognitive side of things because we are sitting in front of a computer where we could potentially use a lot of data and use these, this as a more effective tool. Uh, so for me, obviously working with performance, that's the most exciting part. And I think there's you know, unlimited you know, things that you can actually do with this uh, because it's only up to technology and, and there's so much that we can, it can actually achieve when it comes to this. So, so I think that's one part where there's still a lot to do. Uh, and, and I think it's great uh, initiatives like Asaf has that they are starting to do things like this and that there's more to come when it comes to that. Thank you. Anybody else? I think the opportunity to hear is um, what, what's really special about this market is that you have a very close connection between the gamer, the elite professional gamer and the audience because you can actually uh, hear their thoughts. The gamers are streaming and while they're streaming and playing, they're actually talking to their audience, uh, which is like being engaged with Messi during when uh, his gameplay and uh, get inside his head and really think uh, or hear what he thinks. So when it comes to opportunities, I think the whole uh, gap between the elite gamers and the amateurs, the wannabe professionals, there's a lot of opportunities here to, to uh, um, bridge that gap and to make them more engaged with their fans and more engaged with the gamers that are following them uh, in means of uh, opportunities inside that domain. I, I, uh, I'll add and say that because the, the esports uh, industry, I think there's a, 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 we're starting to see an inflection point. For publishers, it was a player acquisition and retention tool, uh, primarily. And they're seeing it turned into its own industry. Uh, so I think they're going to open the doors. And opening the doors in the game industry, again, goes back to kind of what we're seeing at Overwolf, allows for independent players, whether they're solo or startups or whatnot, to come in and invent things. So a lot of the games that we have and we compete on Team Fortress are, were created as a result of another game. They're modded games. Uh, Team Fortress 2, which pushed Overwatch. I mean, each, each one of the competitive games is an offshoot of some other big game. So I think that what we'll be seeing is a lot more creativity around competition inside any given game. So right now, the games are still, they're just starting to open up. We see it with Roblox and some of the more contained environments, but what we're gonna see is, is competitions take new shapes and forms. And that's going to allow the influencers and the streamers and the gamers to engage in all sorts of ways and the, and the publisher, and then the advertisers, which are half old school and half new school, are starting to catch up. They're going to understand that it's full on digital. I mean, we're really at the infancy of this thing. And we're going to see a lot of, 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 
of the money move into this industry very fast in the next two years. It's going to blow out um, once the publisher release their control, which is starting to happen right now. I just, if you don't mind, I just wanted to say something about what uh, Saf said about uh, what he's working on that let's say everything, everybody signs in and do it and everything is great. What's beautiful about gaming and it relates to, let's say, Fnatic, uh, that a lot of people want to come and have an access to those teams and trying to have a spot in those teams. The thing is, uh, if there was a system that could map the people that have the potential to get there, which is uh, right now it's not really available unless you sign and you have a boot camp and stuff like that, it will give options even for professional uh, teams like them uh, to pick people that they never thought about before. Uh, and it's relating to the other thing I wanted to say that gaming is for everybody. It doesn't matter if you're short, you're tall, unfortunately, if you have a certain type of disability or not. Systems like this will even pass that gap because people will be measured upon their reach, upon how their uh, learning level is and how they progress. So that will give even options to big teams and professional teams like that to uh, reach everybody. When I mean everybody, it's everybody because they will rely on a database that will show him if this gamer is good enough to be in that platform, regardless of who he is, from where he is and stuff like that. So I think there's a lot of stuff that are beyond um, teaching gamers to be better. It's maybe will might give them access to get to those teams because they had those obstacles thus far. So that's actually a beautiful thing to do. Yeah, and, and on that, I think it's a great point. I think gaming really is like the great equalizer in the sense that you can compete and be just as good as anybody else. And no matter what your physical limitations may be, that really doesn't matter. And I think there's really nothing else out there that's this competitive that offers that. So as somebody that just loves video games and loves this, this world, I think that's my favorite part of it is seeing a kid who maybe didn't succeed on a traditional sports field, but is the best at whatever they're doing in the virtual world. And they build a whole network of friends or a whole group of people that, that love what they do in that virtual battleground. And I think that's a beautiful thing, like you said. So. Yeah, we all run at the same pace in Call of Duty, so it doesn't matter, you know? It's all good. Yeah, exactly. Actually, that's a very uh, interesting point that uh, both Ruth and James brought up. It's uh, how kids today interact with uh, with gaming in a completely different way. Today, uh, at least I see from uh, my nephews, right? Uh, in, in their schools, popular kids are not the jocks anymore, not the, the athletes. It doesn't matter if you can shoot a hoop. Um, everybody's on the phone, they're playing, they're gaming. Um, and those are, you know, they are the future. They are the, what matters. We, we don't matter anymore. Um, so that's very exciting. And, and I think I like the approach of the education and the collaborative and the team wise. Um, also, we all know, right, that uh, online can be a very dark place and we all see uh, rude comments, et cetera. So uh, I know some of the big publishers are fighting that uh, very extensively. Um, but yeah, well, th this was, actually awesome awesome discussion and uh, i want to with the time we have left to open uh, this uh, discussion to the crowd um so um if uh, nobody um yeah i don't see any uh, questions in the chat so let's give people uh, um, the opportunity to unmute themselves um so if you want to have a question so please go ahead and unmute yourself and jump in Hi, my name is Daddy. I'm a game designer. Uh, I would like to ask the forum, uh, how do you see the future of the game uh, ecosystem? Is it going to be consolidated to one or two big games that everyone will watch, like basketball and uh, football? Or is it going to be a fracture to many small uh, games that will have everyone, every game will have its own community and uh, ecosystem? Yeah, I'll jump on that first. I think it's going to be really interesting to see how this continues to develop. I think we've seen games, whether it be Team Fortress 2 and, and now even Fortnite and some of these other major games that Counter-Strike, that have been around for so long, but they create their own ecosystem within the game. And I think we're going to continue to see the growth of games kind of going into other games in the sense of there's going to be one big ecosystem of an FPS, uh, or F, sorry, uh, first person, third person, whatever it is, but these games kind of having the same types of people playing each one. And I think we are seeing that, we're seeing the same people streaming that, but there's gonna be more and more collaboration between those games. 
Um, and I think like we've seen like an Apex Legends right now, which is going from a battle royale to creating a version that's a little bit more tactical and kind of merging the two. So I think it's, again, we're going to see these games try to continue to stay um, as one title um, and, and not maybe go the, the Call of Duty route where it is a new title every year um, instead of more so uh, updates and continued engagement from the developers. So um, it's going to be really interesting to see the, the, the growth here and the path forward. I, uh, I think you're going to see a lot more players in the space. Naturally, there's going to be a few games that are going to drive all the monetization on this thing. Um, and we know who the big players right now are, but I think you're going to see the space blow up because once the more creativity comes into spot and more gates allow for people to create and run their own links. I mean, at the end, like uh, it's going to follow a very similar pattern to, to the influencers, right? So Quinn Nikki here can make a living off a thousand people following her, for instance, just as a, as a broad. Games can have that. They can have suddenly uh, a spike if somebody opens up some kind of a mod that allows a competition in a game that didn't have before. We've seen that multiple times in the industry that games can suddenly spike up and communities wake up and gather. So I think you're going to see a very robust creative community around all sorts of games that we're not even thinking about right now. With a few dominant players that are going to drive the league, that the Activision and uh, and Epic and all and Riot are going to probably drive, but a lot of versatility. Yeah, I think I think I agree on that. I, I think the the big the big companies like Riot, Activision, and so on, they're obviously going to try to make more robust leagues uh, like they're trying to do. So so that it really becomes a, you know, sort of a solid business model. Uh, I think that's gonna continue to grow and, and be the way forward for the, for the big names. But I always think, and, and this is what makes esports exciting as well. You don't know which game is gonna be the next big thing uh, because the community has so much to say because the streamers have so much say in it. Uh, and I think that's always gonna be the case and I hope it will be the case so that there will be that, you know, change of things and change of pace and excitement in it. And, and, and you can see, you know, Among Us, a game that didn't exist yeah. two years ago, is just blowing up. So, or even in Roblox, you just need some creator to come and just create a competition within that world that hasn't created before, and boom, and just something happens. So this is all rather Mason. Yeah, Leo, did you want to say something? I think I was just about to say that I wanted to give Among Us as an example. That was a game that was on for like three years, and some streamers started to play it, and it just blew up. So you have like, you know, some you can call it. Uh, I don't know if I'm phrasing it right, like pop up shops, like that pop up once in a while, and it's a good product. It runs for a while, and you can create good content around it, and even tournaments for that time. Sometimes it sticks, sometimes it don't. Like you mentioned, that, that's something that hurts me personally, Call of Duty, that they released every year a new one. And I wish it was like CS and other ones that would just, uh, you know, keep the rank for a long time with the same rules and everything. Uh, but I think you'll have a lot of players coming in. And it's actually a really good thing because it gives smaller uh, developers and smaller companies, like even indie companies that creating those small games that can just pop up because a streamer liked it. So you're going to have the major uh, players as, as usual, CS, Fortnite, and all the rest. But you're going to see those uh, little ones jump in uh, once in a while, which is really, really cool. It's refreshing. So, yeah. And maybe it's a, it's a cool uh, thing so to discuss uh, later about the indie games. Maybe that's a, a whole session about itself. But yeah, go ahead, Asaf. I'm sorry. And Asaf froze. OK. So yeah. Lovely picture of Asaf. Somebody take a screenshot of that. Um, I don't know if he will come back on. So, okay, let's uh, let's with the time we have left, let's uh, open up for another uh, last question from the crowd. Um, if anybody wants to take it or just pop up with a question. Anyone? I have a question. I have a question. Okay. Hey, uh, a lot of questions, but I'll, I'll start with an esport question. So we see all these games coming up, like Valorant and Apex, and a lot of investment from the game publishers around it. And ideally, they really want not just the streamers and content creators community to pick up, but ideally the esports clubs. And you know, we see these teams forming up. And I wonder, what does it take for a new game to actually 
become that popular and be able to uh, go up to this really top list and, 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 and become a new phenomenon. In, in other words, what is the process for a new game to become a real esports phenomenon? And is it pure game publisher investment with the community? And it's, uh, it's uh, how long is this process? What needs to happen there? Is this going to accelerate or we're going to, or the game publishers still haven't figured it? Mm -hmm. I, uh, I'll answer Ori, hi, nice to see you. Um, I think that the ball mainly is in the hands of a publisher. Publishers are, this is what makes this uh, industry so unique, are the one all be all, they rule everything. That's why the movie industry haven't made more games into movies. They own the IP, they decide what goes with IP. So first of all, you need to mature a game to a place where it becomes big enough. That's one way. The other way is a community of zealots that are just crazy about the game. And that doesn't require a big community. You can have a few thousands, thousands of people decide that this game is massive. You'll see these in Asia. You'll see a 10,000 people game, but they're all big whales and they're crazy. And the sums of money are insane on a very small community. So. It's either a very, very strong zealot type of community that's going to drive a sport or a massive IP maturing by a publisher. So I think that these two, these two are the main phenomena as you can see, but I, I, I see it happening in particular from the community side, put in a bunch of really hardcore streamers, a thousand people community that are really excited about something, drop one or two Chinese billionaires inside and you got a league going on. Asaf, I see you're back. So did you want to uh, say something over there? Yeah, I just wanted to say about the traditional sports, about the earlier question, uh, that I think we can see the comparison between the two industries, that we have a lot of games, right? You have card games, you have sport games, you have games where you shoot where with arrows, with a ball, and yet we have the uh, most famous games. You have the soccer, basketball, which gains the most... Uh, viewers and players. And I think it will be the same in the gaming industry that you will have, still have the main players out there with Epic Games, Fortnite, uh, with uh, Valve, Counter-Strike, and etc. But we will still see a lot of new games. And, you know, out of the new million games, maybe one of them will pop up like we saw Among Us. But mainly we can still rely that the main games will still be here for a long while. This is what, the way I think about this uh, whole market. Okay, so uh, we're uh, going to get ready to wrap up um, because we're running out of time. So this was awesome. And I hope everybody uh, had a good time and that we, as, as, uh, as the participants in the panel, uh, helped to shed some light on the exciting world of esports and gaming and how fast it is moving from basements to stadiums. Um, again, thank you to all our awesome uh, panelists, uh, Reut, Jens, uh, Jens, uh, Asaf, uh, Shachar, um, everybody that were with us today, thank you. Um, I wanna make sure that uh, everybody here uh, follows up with you know, uh, both uh, Reut and Fnatic and Edge and Overwolf and all those uh, social medias we as adventures, we have our uh, traditional social uh, media channels and make sure you follow them on LinkedIn, Twi uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, because we're going to have a lot of, of webinars coming up, different subjects all the time, trying to enrich the, the ecosystem and our uh, investor base. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, we had a good time. Um, so, and ah, I see Uri, you've been trolling us uh, all night long with uh, Pepe. The... I see, very good job, Uri. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, ciao. Thank you. Thank you very much. Auf Wiedersehen. Yes. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.